Okay, this is module six. Uh, you are nearly done here with Old Testament two. Uh, today we are going to talk about Psalms and Lamentations. Uh, I'm going to hit a few high points from the notes. Um, I'll try to keep it short as usual. So uh, when we talk about the poetic books, um, we're talking about wisdom literature um, and poetic books and, and, and kind of how these terms get used interchangeably. Uh, three of the five poetic books can be defined as wisdom. Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. So there's really three dimensions uh, to this idea of wisdom literature. Literature. <laughs> they are personal. Um, they they focus on an individual and an individual's uh, response to the world. So uh, hokma is a Hebrew word. It's used of philosophy and practical skills such as those associated with artisans and wisdom can involve things that you do with your hands. Uh, another point to keep in mind is that wisdom is what enables a person to make sense of the world. It involves uh, a horizontal and vertical aspect of, of life. And so um, the undergirding principle here is the fear of the Lord. Um, wisdom involves understanding the presence of God in the physical universe and human social order. And it, ex it is expressed in writing through several forms, uh, proverbs, riddles, allegory, uh, even autobi autobiographical narrative, uh, and prophetic address. So now that we've talked about the dimensions, let's talk about the relationship to law and prophecy. Uh, it addresses the individual, wisdom literature does, rather than the nation. Uh, it's meant to instruct the young on how to live an orderly life. So like law, wisdom is sought to develop a comprehensive worldview. It draws from the law. Uh, it's not meant to stand alone. It undergirds the law. Uh, it shares the concerns of the prophets for truth and justice and righteousness. And uh, when we look at the ancient Near East, um, you see wisdom is a category or a genre that's used in other ancient Near Eastern cultures. Uh, most of the parallels come from Egypt. Uh, they had a pretty established tradition, but there are other places. Uh, the Sumerians wrote some proverbs and things. Um, so you see that it was, it was a genre of literature that was understood on the world stage and that Israel put its own stamp on uh, as inspired by God. So let's talk specifically about the Psalms. The Psalms were composed um, over time. Uh, they did not exist in the form that we have them now until sometime after the exile. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls indicate that books one, two, three were in their canonical form by that period, but books four through five were still being put into their current order. Um, it may have achieved its final order just prior to the time of Christ. Um, we say that because we seem to have the current order somewhere around that time. So it's important to distinguish between the purposes of the editor and the author. Uh, and these, these Psalms were composed by an author, um, a lot of times David, uh, we, we see sons of Korah and some other, some other entities in here as well, uh, but they're arranged by an editor um, later on. It doesn't mean that the Psalms are not Davidic. They are. They're written by David largely, uh, but they were arranged at a later time. Um, 73 of the Psalms are attributed to David. Psalm 90 is attributed to Moses, which would be very early on. Uh, a couple to Solomon, uh, some to Asaph, uh, there's Ethan, and uh, the sons of Korah, as I mentioned before. So the book function has been edited to function uh, as a whole, much like uh, we would think of a cantata or a uh, you know earlier uh, symphony. You had several movements to that. Uh, so 
they come. So the, the seams of Psalms gives us an indicator into what the editor was trying to emphasize. These seams come at the end of the four books, um, Psalm 41, Psalm 72, 89, and 106. Uh, and then when you look at Psalm 1 and 2, seems to be uh, a, a, an introduction that lays out kind of a thematic introduction to the Psalms. And so the arrangement means that the Psalms as a whole have a message that transcends any single psalm. So every psalm has its own message, but it's contributing in larger part to the overall message of the psalm. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about um, the study of the book and the study of, can of canon. Uh, so that's what we're talking about here with psalms. Uh, when we talk about forms, they can be broken into three general categories, praise, wisdom, and lament. Uh, all of which have their own subcategories, of course, because people love to categorize things. Um, we're going to move on to comparative content. Most of the laments in Mesopotamian literature are joined to magic rituals. Um, in Mesopotamia, we're, we're getting away from the Bible now. Uh, Mesopotamian worshiper does not assume that God is just or consistent. The goal is to appease God with appropriate ritual. Uh, gods are tied to nature and can be manipulated. On the other hand, the biblical laments often have the assumption that the author is innocent and seeking vindication. Uh, the psalmist, If the psalmist is guilty, the offense is usually of a moral or ethical sort in their repenting of that. So the Mesopotamian guilt usually comes from a cultic infraction rather than um, a moral or ethical sort of thing. So the views of God in the Bible and Mesopotamian Psalms, those are in contrast to one another, okay? Um, let's move on to uh, section number eight, uh, where it talks about more on the contents of the books. Let's talk about how each book of Psalms kind of works. Uh, book one is mostly laments, parallels the time of David spent in the wilderness fleeing from Saul. So you, they're arranged to sort of give chronology to them. So David's fleeing from Saul. Uh, Psalm 3 through 13 parallels the time of 1 Samuel 19 through 23. Um, and so you can see it moving through time. Psalm 27 through 30 correlate with David's spare, sparring with uh, Saul uh, and sparing his life a second time. So then, <clears throat> moving out of book one into book two, correlates with David's reign as recorded in 2 Samuel. Uh, so Psalm 54 through 64 probably parallel the crisis with Absalom. Moving to book three, uh, it's difficult to pinpoint in terms of historical connection. Um, Psalm 78 offers insight into maybe the fall of the northern kingdom and 70 or 89 offers a crisis and resolution to um, or look at the, the crisis and the resolution to that crisis. Uh, the book may be limited to um, Assyria. Hard to really know. Uh, then when we move to book four, it begins with a psalm of Moses and ends with a recapitulation of a history of rebellion. So it's kind of telling the story of the rebellion of the people. Um, and then the, the final part here um, moves into a hope and a plea for restoration. So in the fourth book of the Psalms, think of it as the fourth movement of Psalms, um, you see themes such as the Lord is king not a human king, a, a new song, a uh, deliverance uh, that idol worshipers would be put to shame and that Yahweh is above all gods. Uh, you see judgment on the nations as well as, as other things and this continuing faithfulness to God. So then we move to book five, beginning in Psalm 107, where the Israelites thankfulness, they express thankfulness to God for regathering them. This is a regathered, reconstituted people. Psalm 145 serves as a conclusion to that book, while 146 through 150 kind of work as a 
finale to the entire composition. So that's sort of how the book works as a whole. I want to drill down on the theology of Psalm 119, which is on page five in your notes. And there's a reason for this. You, you're required to talk about Psalm 119 in a few places. So looking at Psalm 119, Olive through Tav, um, the, the letters function as a structure that gives a message of completeness. We've gone through the whole alphabet, so everything is complete in this way of thinking. Uh, it's the perfection of the Torah of Yahweh. Uh, no part of the Torah is incomplete. Uh, it omits any human mediation in the giving of the Torah. Uh, the giving of the Torah belongs to Yahweh alone. In this psalm, um, we see language uh, of, of an affective type uh, in Deuteron like Deuteronomy with phrases like loving the Torah with all one's heart and listening and keeping the Torah. So the main point is that a blessed and spotless life can only be found by immersing oneself in the Torah and devoting oneself completely to it. Uh, and that is how one expresses devotion uh, to the, the God that they love. And so that is kind of an overall look at Psalm 119. Uh, remember, it fits into the different books in the Psalms and functions as a major um, contributor to the overall message of Psalms. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, 832-794-1891 if you have any questions or comments. All right. Thank you.